Hi, I'm Pete Ayer. I wanted to share with you a bit about my friend Nathan Larson, who's now in federal prison. He's caged for an action for which there is no victim, and when there is no victim, there is no crime. That said, I know some of you will take issue with Nathan's tactics. He threatened to kill the president. But it's my hope that with this video and related content, should you choose to investigate further, will cause you to think about his situation with an open mind and really think about who were the aggressors and who are the victims. With that, let me get to some background. Nathan grew up in Virginia, and thanks to his involvement with school politics, he says he began to see that democracy didn't quite work as well as his teachers claimed. At one point, he says he self-described as a socialist, though he wrote that he always knew something was wrong, that all government programs, such as the school system, were wasteful, tyrannical, and an impediment to his potential. After high school, Nathan went to George Mason University, where he majored in management. There, he had an economics class taught by Professor Thomas Rustizi, which was integral to his affinity for libertarianism. In 2003, Nathan graduated from college, and after passing his CPA exam, worked in the accounting fields and later as a computer programmer. In 2008, five years after graduating from college, Nathan declared his candidacy in Virginia's first congressional district. He was nominated by the Libertarian Party and endorsed by the Independent Greens. During this time, Nathan's passion for liberty continued to grow. He read Mary Ruart's How I Became a Libertarian, which among other things communicates that helping others is good, but not when it's forced at the barrel of a gun. From Ruart's essay, Nathan learned of and read The Market for Liberty by Morris and Linda Tannehill, a groundbreaking book published over four decades ago that demolishes the idea that a centralized bureaucracy sheltered from competition can best provide goods or services. The writings of Ayn Rand, Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Bruce Benson, and others caused Nathan to conclude that everything now done by government could be more efficiently done through consensual interactions between individuals. These ideas and their implications weighed heavily on Nathan throughout the election. He wrote, As the race went on, I started doubting more and more the workability of ending oppression through the democratic channels and wondering whether it wouldn't be just as well to do what Timothy McVeigh did and truck bomb the government. I began discussing the merits of this idea on the internet, and evidently someone reported me to the FBI. The FBI contacted his mom and threatened that Nathan would be arrested for terrorism unless she agreed to help obtain an emergency detention order to place him in a mental hospital. She agreed. Based on advice from his court-appointed attorney and fearing an indefinite hold or loss of his legal rights to possess firearms, Nathan agreed to a few-day voluntary commitment at the Center for Psychiatric and Addiction Treatment at Prince William Hospital in Maryland. There, after being handcuffed to a bed while blood samples were drawn, a service for which Nathan was later charged, a government doctor concluded that he had a severe delusional disorder. Quickly, let me note that this tactic, ascribing a mental illness to those who question man-made legislation that conflicts with natural law, is something governments have historically done to discredit ideas that erode their claimed legitimacy. After a short time at the facility, Nathan concluded that he wanted to focus on his campaign and sought to leave. It was concluded that he was not in imminent danger and was released. The election results came in. Nathan received over 5,000 votes for about 1.5% of the total. Soon after, he moved to Colorado, where his sister had been living. By this time, Nathan had read a couple of other books worth mentioning. The first was Murray Rothbard's For New Liberty, which includes the following passage. Guerrilla warfare has proved to be an irresistible force precisely because it stems not from a dictatorial central government, but from the people themselves fighting for liberty and independence. The second book was Unintended Consequences by John Ross, which tells the story of individuals who used what they'd consider defensive force to stand for their rights against their oppressors. After living in Boulder for a month, Nathan wrote that he was tired of serving as a government slave and sent an email to comments at whitehouse.gov. In his own words, Dear Secret Service, I am writing to inform you that in the near future I will kill the President of the United States of America. My primary motivation for doing so is that he is the leader of the largest and most dangerous criminal organization in the world, namely the United States government. Among the many unlawful activities it engages in is a nationwide protection racket in which it extorts money from non-consenting citizens in exchange for protection from aggression. If a citizen refuses to pay, then the government itself commits aggression against him, either by stealing his property, kidnapping and falsely imprisoning him, or killing him if he attempts to use weapons to resist. The next day, two Secret Service agents visited Nathan at work. He later wrote about the experience. They said that if I were to tell them that my email was not a serious threat, they could report that to their superiors and let me go. 
but if I maintained that I were serious, they would have to arrest me. I responded that I was serious and meant what I wrote in the email. Nathan was arrested and brought to the Denver City Jail. On December 15, 2008, Nathan was indicted by a federal grand jury in Denver and was ordered held until trial at Inglewood Federal Detention Center in Littleton, Colorado. While there, he underwent a battery of psychological examinations. He wrote, I had a two-day evaluation which found that I had an IQ in the top 0.5% of the U.S. population and that I had a depressive disorder not otherwise specified and a personality disorder not otherwise specified. Nathan says this diagnosis was made in part because the psychologist didn't believe his story about previous interactions with the FBI. Nathan's court-appointed attorney encouraged him to plead insanity. Instead, Nathan fired his attorney and proceeded pro se. On May 14, 2009, Five months after sending the email, in a case investigated by the Secret Service, prosecuted by Assistant U.S. Attorney Kurt Bond, and ruled on by U.S. District Court Judge Philip Rimmer, Nathan pled guilty to threatening to take the life of and inflict great bodily harm on the President of the United States. He was sentenced to 16 months in prison and three years supervised release. Nathan was caged merely for typing words, while everyone else involved in this process, from those who handcuffed and transported him, to those who prosecuted and sentenced him, subsist on stolen money. Just who are the real criminals, and who deserves to be in a cage? Nathan wrote, There were several factors that influenced my decision to plead guilty. The difficulty in preparing a case from inside prison was a major one. Another was the fact that I would face two to three times as much prison time if I were to plead not guilty and lose at trial. Then there was a the fact that I had already served five months that I would not be able to get back even if I were acquitted. At one point during this process, Nathan was asked by the Secret Service what he would do if he were in the room with the President. Nathan wrote, I thought to myself, if I had that kind of access to the President to where I could engage in conversation with him, it might not be necessary to use force. Of course, it takes a substantial amount of time and preparation to present a convincing argument, and even then, persuasion doesn't always work, but it certainly helps to at least have a chance. Later, in another message, Nathan wrote, Looking back on it, I would say that my actions were poorly planned. Anytime you're trying to accomplish something as an activist, you have to do a bit of planning. I was just thinking, heck with it. These guys are infringing our rights. I'm tired of living under slavery, and I'm going to do something about it right now. Eventually, Nathan was released from prison, and he returned to Virginia, where he began his supervised release. He started keeping an online journal, he wrote, There were a lot of disturbing aspects of this court case. For one thing, my penalty was doubled because the victim was an official victim, but it's kind of questionable how much the president was really victimized, given that he was never made aware that a threat ever existed. Suppose someone comes up to me and informs me that he's going to kill you. If he never takes action to actually do it, and you never find out that he's made a threat, have you been victimized? Many people thought that my threat against the president was indirect civil disobedience, but really it was direct civil disobedience. I was protesting the laws that say we can't threaten to kill the president. Those laws are immoral because I have the right to threaten to use retaliatory force against an aggressor. On August 4th, 2010, Nathan sent a letter to to his probation officer Barry Raymond, which stated in part, I have decided not to take any more supervised urine screens. The reason is that I regard them as an invasion of privacy. He also used the opportunity to remind Raymond that his actions violated the rights of others and encourage him to cease such actions and speak out against them rather than continue to perpetuate them. A few days later, he sent Raymond a second letter, which noted in part, I have decided not to comply with my conditions of supervised release anymore. The United States government has no rightful claim to jurisdiction over me, and I am not morally bound to obey any of its laws or officers. In throwing off the federal yoke, I am exercising the right of individual sovereignty to which I am entitled under natural law. I may as well rebel completely and go back to prison. That way, I stand a chance of leaving the criminal justice system in 2012 rather than in 2013 or beyond. For his rebellion, Nathan was caged a second time this time at the federal prison in Petersburg, Virginia, just outside of Richmond. He's due to be released in May of 2012.
My intention with this video was to give you an overview of Nathan's situation and encourage you to think about the role of individual rights and to conclude that we each have the right to govern ourselves and that no one has extra rights no matter where they work, no matter what costume they wear, and to see that when there's no victim, there is no crime. Nathan did not harm anybody, and in fact, the people who put him in a cage are the real aggressors. Thank you. If you're so inclined, I encourage you to contact Nathan. He, I found him to be one of the brightest and most thought-provoking people I've had the opportunity to meet. To learn more about Nathan and other individuals incarcerated for questioning the status quo, check out PrisonersForLiberty.com. There you'll see dozens and dozens of emails and letters that Nathan has sent, which show that he's a person not much different than you or I. He's not violent, he's not the monster the state has made him out to be, and he doesn't deserve to be in a cage. You'll see that uh, he's filed a couple appeals on his own behalf, that he's now teaching an economics class to fellow prisoners that he has interest in potentially moving to New Hampshire when he's released uh, to start a business. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, you'll see his thoughts on big picture existentialist questions, philosophy, all sorts of subjects. Um, but most importantly, you'll see that his motivation uh, for sending the email was not done out of violence, but to cause people to think. He merely wanted to uh, point out just how far gone the conversation is today. Uh, where most people sit idly by as they're stolen from and their choices are restricted or denied by other people who claim authority over them. Um, Nathan's action is, is a free speech issue and he doesn't deserve to be in a cage.